Hi, welcome back. And I'm here with Barry Uremcio from Alberta Agriculture. And uh, Barry is the last uh, livestock nutritionist for the government of Alberta. Is that correct? Unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately, okay. Well, so we're very lucky to have the last nutritionist uh, with us with the, with the Alberta Agriculture. And today we're going to talk about residual feed intake. We talked a little bit before with uh, uh, a previous guest on that, but you're going to give us a little bit more um, understanding of that whole concept. And then you're going to talk a little bit about uh, the, some of the bale processing work you've been doing and some of the economics around uh, bale feeding and bale processing. So, you know, over to you, Barry. Thanks for being on, first of all. Thank you very much for inviting and, me. And uh, tell us about... Um, Tell us about residual feed intake. Residual feed intake is a project that jo Dr. John Basarab has been working on for the last uh, probably 10 years. And what they're finding is this is a trait that is heritable, meaning that an animal that has the ability to convert feed more efficiently than one of its pen mates is going to make you more money in the long run. Mm -hmm. So what they've done is they've used the grow safe system to establish how much how much feed an animal will take in and then work backwards to the amount of gain that animal has and those that are more efficient say an animal will take two or three pounds less feed to produce a pound of gain that's the one that's going to make you more money and if you can identify the cow or identify the heifer that is more efficient when that animal is bred to produce the next offspring it will be more efficient as well and it will carry on from generation to generation. So it's a genetics tool as well. Absolutely it is. There are some EPDs that are being used in the states for residual feed intake to uh, if, you're per, 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 uh, if you're selecting a bull at a, at a show or a sale or you're going to a farm to pick a bull if you can use that EPD to become more efficient more power to you. Yeah, and there's a cost savings to that as well obviously that we heard before in terms of less feed uh, consumed over time. Okay, now that's fantastic. You've done some work on bale processing and I think there's some some interesting uh, uh, results you found. So tell us a little bit about that. Uh, we did some research at the Lacombe Research Station at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and what we looked at was if you uh, when we looked at the uh, situation people were getting into bale processing because they were short of staff mm -hmm. or short of manpower and they needed to get the animals fed. And the, the thought at that time was if you use a bale processor, it'll be more efficient. You'll be able to use less feed and become more cost efficient in what you're doing. And unfortunately, that's not what the story is so, after we did the work. So what is the story? With, we compared uh, the uh, traditional method of older system or method of uh, Unrolling the bale out on the on the snow, what they've done for years and years, compared to a bale processor, and then we went ahead and uh, you put the uh, feed from a bale processor into a portable feed bunk. Okay. What we found was with the bale processor, there was 19% waste, compared to 12% waste when you unrolled the bale on onto the ground. When you put the bale through the processor into a feed bunk. As long as that feed got into the bunk, the waste was zero. Mm -hmm. So a huge difference in e economies and efficiencies when you look at the three different systems. Now you've brought some slides along with that too. So uh, we're looking at one here of basically how everything was put together. And uh, tell us a little bit what's going on here. When we looked at the trial, we needed a way to f pick up and, and collect the wasted feed that these animals didn't consume. So before the snow fell, we put out tarps that were seven and a half feet wide by 15 feet long in a row so that when we did process the feed it would go across the tarp. When the cows would actually eat the feed and whatever was left behind it would eventually land on top of that tarp and stay there until either we picked the tarp up or we let the uh, mother nature help us uh, melt the snow and collect the feed afterwards. Fantastic. So that's a fairly typical uh, situation where people either blade off the snow or feed directly onto the snow and for us to give the worst case or the best case scenario for feed waste we restricted their feed intake by 10 percent compared to what NRC or National Research Council recommended for the for the heifers or for the cows and in this case the 1100 pound animals were getting 22.7 pounds of feed on a daily basis 
If they were still hungry and they wanted to pick up a little bit of straw off the bedding pack, that would fill them up and, and uh, finish off the ration for the day. So let's have a look at some of the results here. Um, got a couple uh, slides here of, of, of the work that you've been doing in the field. But let's have a look at, um, I think you've got some economic numbers in here as well. Right. Which one do we want to we'll, chat with? Well, oh, let's just go down to the bottom one. Okay. The first thing that we found out is the feed was mixed uh, throughout the layer of snow. The hooves were great action to break the snow crust and mix that feed from the top to the bottom. And it's, it's very apparent that it's hard to see what feed is there. So you don't visualize, you can't appreciate how much feed is being lost. 75% mm -hmm. of the waste was the fine material, the stuff that was less than three quarters of an inch in length. And that was the, the fine leaves, the high quality portion of the ration. So in fact, what's happening when we took the average feed analysis results of 11%, before we fed that hay, when we looked at the waste and, and reduced or calculated backwards to what was actually lost, we found out that the protein content in that hay for what they were consuming actually went down to 8.6%. So what does this mean for the producer in terms of economics? What they're looking at is using a bale processor, by the time they add additional feed to make up the losses and the extra time on the tractor, it's costing him roughly $65 a winter to feed those cows for 175 days. Okay, so what is your recommendation then based upon this uh, uh, research? If you need to use the bale processor, the biggest thing you can do is build a portable feed bunk. Okay. Use drill stem, make the feeders 28 feet long, six to six and a half feet wide and roughly 30 inches tall. Uh, the first thing the guys are going to say is with 30 inches tall, those cows are going to jump in there. So what you do is you go ahead and keep the bottom of the trough in about 16 to 18 inches. So you're basically making a soup bowl. When that cow puts the first foot in, if she can't put it on the ground, she's not going to be able to lift the other foot in and, and actually walk into the feeder. Oh, good point. So some operational improvements really to, to see a, a savings in, your, in, in what you've found. Well, with, uh, with the feeding processor, if you're feeding on the ground, you're going to need one extra bale of feed per winter, 14 to 1,500 pounds of hay to mm -hmm. make it through the winter. So you're only getting two bales an acre, you're feeding 200 cows. There's 100 acres of grassland or hayland that you don't have to make feed on to, to feed those animals for the winter. And well, that's a pretty significant uh, feed cost uh, reduction. When we come back, you're going to talk about uh, uh, swath grazing and a case study with corn millet. So uh, join us shortly. Mm -hmm.